Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming along this evening to this um, event, which is all about tax justice and why tax justice is so important for so many people living in poverty, both here in the UK and around the world. Tax dodging has been described as one of the greatest scandals since slavery. We estimate, Christian Aid estimates, that it costs poor countries $160 billion every year. That's more than the global aid budget, much more than the global aid budget. It's an astonishing statistic and one that desperately needs to be corrected and tackled. Tax dodging is not about just clever accountancy. It is about that, but its real impact is on those who live in poverty, those who are struggling to survive. Because when companies dodge the taxes they owe in poor countries, they're denying revenue from the poorest. They're denying revenue from governments who need it to invest in schools and hospitals and other essential services that, that many of us benef benefit from here in the UK, thanks to taxes. That's why we've teamed up with Church Action on Poverty this autumn to take the message of tax justice on the road, quite literally, um, with our bus tour. Over the course of nearly eight weeks, we're traveling all around the UK and Ireland, taking a message that tax dodging hurts the poor. It really hurts them, and it's something that should not be happening. It is something that can and must be tackled by our political leaders and by business leaders. But those leaders need to be pushed towards tackling it. And that's why support from people like yourselves is so crucial. I said before, tax has quite often in the past been seen as something for accountants. But it's far more than that these days. Tax is a moral issue. And hopefully this evening we'll explain that a little more. It's my pleasure tonight as well to have with us Neil Cooper, who's the National Coordinator uh, for Church Action on Poverty. I'd like to welcome Neil up here now as well to speak from their perspective of how tax dodging hurts the poor here in the UK. Thanks, Hal. Uh, I too am delighted to be here tonight um, to uh, meet all of you and to hear the debate we're going to have. Uh, Church Action on Poverty has been seeking to work with churches to tackle poverty in the UK for the past 30 years. We try to do what, uh, in the words of Jim Wallace, is to go upstream, to look at who and what is creating poverty in what is still one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. Over the past two or three years, talking to our supporters around the country, increasingly we've been drawn to the issue of tax. With the global economic crisis, we are now more than ever aware of the pressure on public finances. The impact of recession, the impact of austerity. So for us, tax dodging is not an abstract issue or an issue that only impacts people in other parts of the world. Tax dodging has direct consequences for all of us. And for us, it's important for three reasons to tackle tax dodging. Firstly, there's an economic reason that it actually impacts on other businesses that do pay their taxes, who then can't compete with companies that don't. And that leads to a loss of jobs, a loss of businesses in our own communities, on our own high streets. Secondly, it affects us as taxpayers. We can be rightly be angry, I think, that when we have no option but to pay our taxes. Corporations and those with fancy accountants can dodge paying their fair share of taxes. But for us, more importantly than either of those two, is the impact that tax dodging has on the poor in our communities. According to the UK government, £35 billion pounds is dodged in tax in the UK. Others put the figure much higher. Set in the context of spending cuts of £30 billion, pounds, you can immediately see the impact of tax dodging. 
Every pound dodged in tax is a pound less to spend on essential public services, on education, on health, and on tackling poverty, very real poverty that we now see in our own communities, in our churches. The number of people turning to food banks has doubled just in the past year. People are really struggling to make ends meet. And for that reason, we're delighted to be working with Christian Aid on the issue of tax dodging. We think it's something which churches should be speaking out loudly and clearly about. So we're delighted you're here tonight. And uh, before you leave, in fact, we're going to lock the doors so that you have to pick up a pack of Tick for Tax Justice action cards before you leave. The whole aim of the Tax Justice bus tour and of the debate tonight is to engage uh, individuals, church leaders, people in churches and beyond, not just with the ideas, but then to take action. So these action cards are for you to sign, to take back to your churches, to get members of your congregations to tick for tax justice, to join up with the campaign. Going around the country over seven weeks to over 100 venues, we are building a momentum for tax justice. We've been talking to church leaders, to politicians who are receptive, but as Al said, they need to be pushed and prodded to take the action that's required. So I'd encourage you not just to listen to the debate, but to take your action cards and join with us in the campaign for tax justice. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Giles Fraser, lurking in the corner here. Um, Giles probably needs no introduction. Um, he is now in his day job. I don't know when you ever have the time to do that, Giles. The priest in charge at St Mary's Newington. But I think most of us will know him best for his time as a canon at St Paul's Cathedral and a slight altercation that happened last year um, at St Paul's and also as a regular columnist in the Church Times and the Guardian and a regular broadcaster. And if by the end of tonight you've not had enough of Giles, you can go home and turn on BBC Two later and you'll see Giles debating the merits of the economic crisis on Newsnight. So, Giles, you're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, if you just walk in from Spitalfields um, along this road up here, you'll see a big sign that says, Mojitos, three for ten pounds. And the fact that so few of you were diverted by that sign is, is astonishing, and thank you for not being. Um, this is one of those subjects which is not immediately glamorous to many people, and part of our job is to make it more interesting um, because it's so important. The fact, that, um, the fact that I discovered the other day, which sort of hit me between the eyes, about tax dodging stroke avoidance, was that the Taj Mahal restaurant, High Street, Jersey, is the UK registered home of 400 British companies. That struck me as the most extraordinary statistic in terms of how people organize their financial affairs and how we do that in this country. We have got a distinguished uh, group of people who are going to help us, uh, stimulate us to understand more about that this a big and important subject of tax dodging. They're slightly spread around the room. So um, could I ask, come on up, Peter, Sabina, come on, come, on, come and sit up here and I can introduce you while you're in front of people. Richard Wellings is there in the middle, is Deputy uh, Editorial Director of the um, IEA, Institute of Economic Affairs, and they're a think tank that campaigns for lower taxes and deregulation. So you're sort of the bad guy here this evening. And I always think that's, that, that's actually a much more interesting thing to play. So you're particularly welcome for coming into what is probably a bit of a bear pit for you. You've been author of like, loads of books and papers and reports, A Beginner's Guide to Liberty, 
and um, your senior fellow at the Cobden Center, Economic Policy Center, and the Libertarian Alliance. Please welcome Dr. Richard Wellings. And on the far right, now that's probably not the right description, <laughs> is uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Sabina Alkaya, who's an Anglican priest in Oxford at uh, Cowley St. John and at Magdalen College Chapel. Um, she's an economist and a bit of a fan of Amartya Sen, and that's uh, where a lot of your work grows out of, I understand. Um, and uh, she directs a research centre at the University of Oxford called the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. And that's about measuring aspects of poverty and measuring bits of poverty that don't often get measured, as I understand it. So, very good. Welcome, Reverend Dr. Sabina Alkaya. We'll do this. And Peter Oborn is one of Britain, on the left here, uh, is one of uh, Britain's most well-respected political journalists, commentators, and he's worked for, you know, you've worked for lots of people, haven't you? The Evening Standard, The Spectator, The Daily Mail, and now you're chief political commentator for The, for the Daily Telegraph. And you're, you're often on the telly and on the radio, and uh, one of your books, The Rise of Political Lying. I haven't read that. Very valuable document. <laughs> Please welcome Peter Oborn. And last but no means least, Savi Mwamba is the Executive Director of the Centre for Trade Policy and Development um, from Zambia. He's a Christian Aid partner and has worked on tax issues in Zambia for many years, specifically working with uh, multinational mining companies who are aggressively tax dodging in Zambia. And you gave evidence UK parliamentary inquiry on tax and development earlier this year. Very good to have you. Please welcome Savi Mwamba. So what I want to ask Savia to start with is if you can just describe for me what the consequences in your part of the world of, of tax dodging, tax avoidance. Uh, thank you very much. Let me thank Christian Aid and his partners for inviting me to participate in this um, obviously interesting discussion. I'm also quite um, privileged to be sharing the panel with the distinguished guest. Essentially, I think one of the reasons why I'm here is to obviously to share my perspective in terms of the real effects of uh, tax avoidance or tax um, evasion, um, as the case may be. My organization, which is CTPD, has been working on monitoring, essentially, the tax practices of multinational companies in Zambia for the last um, three to four years. And interest, inter interestingly enough, we, in our usual research, and it's, it is indeed difficult, as everybody knows, to really pinpoint the, 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 the machinations around how these tax avoidance, tax evasion schemes work in practice. However, I think Zambia presents one of the concrete examples recently with a case of a Glencoe subsidiary of an independently conducted audit report that was commissioned by the Revenue Authority, which actually showed the different schemes that this company um, had been um, undertaking to avoid paying tax. So essentially, when I speak about the effects of, of, of tax avoidance, I, I believe I'm speaking from a very privileged position in that, on one hand, I am preview to the everyday... And what are the effects? I mean, what, what are we talking about, the effects? Of course, first of all, we all know that tax avoided is revenue foregone to the government of Zambia to be able to provide the social services uh, with a country which has a poverty um, level of 68% um, are living below $1 um, per day. You can see the deprivation, um, the huge disease burden that Zambia faces and other African countries. But also, tax is not just a purely technical uh, issue. It is a political issue. If a government cannot, it doesn't have the capacity or cannot raise the kind of taxes it, that it should raise, it takes away the legitimacy of that government. It disconnects the relationship between the citizens and the government. So it's also a governance issue. So the two, the poverty that is worsened by tax avoided and the breakdown in governance because the government is unable to sort of raise money, worsens uh, the state of, of, of poverty and uh, governance uh, 
situation in a country like Zambia. Um, you are all familiar with the statistics um, in, in terms of poverty. So essentially, tax avoided deprives any country of the means, um, the power, and the ability to provide for its people, as the case may be in most of African countries. Peter, the, um, when, when we're talking about 68% um, of people on a dollar a day in those sorts of situations, you do get the feel that, that countries like Zambia are being ripped off. I, I think so. I mean, it's, it's very complex. You, 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 I, I basically, I, I don't want to be... I agree with that people should pay tax, and, but it is also the case, of course, that, Z that Zambia and many other countries will want to have multinational companies investing in them and producing jobs and uh, I would just I don't even make this point so as to uh, point, point out that it is a much more complicated issue than is often the case. I often listening to the introductions the basic point about people in Britain is that we are pretty honest and do pay our tax. Uh, of course there is tax dodging but I think we shouldn't forget the fact that uh, most people, the vast majority of people, including a lot of very rich people and quite a lot of very successful companies, do pay tax in an honest way. Um, the amazing, and, and in Britain, of course, we are so good at paying our tax compared to Zambia or Pakistan or India or uh, many African and, uh, countries. Greece? Uh, um, <laughs> indeed, well, Greece. <laughs> uh, and so let's put this in a bit of boring perspective. Richard. Yes, well, I think um, in many ways it's probably a good thing that um, the Zambian government and many other African governments don't have as much money to spend. Let's face it, it's the government we're talking about, not the people here. And most of these governments are hugely corrupt, they're controlled by elites, they spend that money to buy off various special interests, they don't have the interests of the general public at heart. Um, so, basically, this, to say we're, tax avoidance is denying the people this money is to really be oversimplistic. It's actually denying these corrupt elites with revenues that are used to do a lot of harm, which they do. So, uh, I don't see a massive problem here. So, is your justification for, for, for companies avoiding paying tax in countries that actually you just don't like who they'd be paying it to? I mean, is that the extent of the justification of their tax dodging? Well, I think it's a complicated issue, as Peter says, and, and one thing I am uncomfortable about is the extent to which um, these companies, for example, mining companies, are operating on land that was stolen from the people who live in those areas, and I, I'm a very big fan of property rights. So, really, um, there's a nexus of corruption between a lot of, of these big businesses and the uh, governments of uh, countries like these. Sabina, do you want to chip in on this? Yeah, um, economists are known for being ambiguous, and I think I would, I would be both, in that, yes, certainly many developing countries need more public sector funds. Let's take the example of India. India has about the same gross national income per capita as the Philippines, $10 different in 2011, but by our multidimensional poverty measure in the Philippines, there are 13% of people who are poor, and in India, there are 53% of people who are poor. Income figures are similar. But in East Asia and the Pacific, on average, the per capita expenditure in health by government is $167 per person per year. In India, it's $38. Um, and that public health expenditure in India is only 29% of their overall expenditure. So much more of the public expenditure goes to the rich in that country. And so, it's, it epitomizes the problem. On the one hand, countries, including middle-income countries, where 72% of the world's poor by either income or a multidimensional poverty measure live, um, have the internal capacity to reduce acute poverty and are not doing so. And the public expenditure in some key services is too low. Now, we will disagree um, ideologically about public and private sector, but I don't think ideology is the, is the answer here. I think the question is in each country, what are the institutions that work? But whether the, the dominance is public or private sector, there is a role for public sector. If you favor private sector delivery of education and of health care, you still <coughs> need to regulate the quacks and the crooks. You still need to tell parents who are illiterate which s schools are actually teaching well. And so there's still a, a, a role for a functioning public sector with resources to have an effective regulatory framework. In other places, and there has been no genuine health breakthroughs without universal health care as a backup in developing countries, you need a lot. So I think 
the tax justice argument affects the poor. It has to be nuanced to see the institutional framework of each country, uh, but uh, the, the paucity of resources available for that kind of investment in middle-income countries um, is borne out by their high levels of poverty. Look, the, the, the thing most of us, many of us, I think, feel, and the, the anxiety, is when you hear about companies, let's not talk about mining, companies like Amazon, who you know, are deemed to have such a sort of complicated international framework that they can move their liabilities and all their business stuff all over the place in such a way that actually they're, they're paying almost zero tax at all in, those, in, in this sort of globalized framework. I think there is, there's, there's a very strong sense, I mean, irrespective of your, I'm talking to Richard, but I'm gonna play it out here, irrespective of your sort of suspicion of big government or corrupt government or whatever it is, there's something just in and of itself wrong about that sort of behavior, isn't there? No, I think you could turn it on its head and say that um, given the huge amount of harm that governments do, then, I mean, for many people, particularly libertarians, it's actually a strong ethical um, duty to actually pay as little tax as possible. So one example is, where's, I mean, where's, where's the tax money going? It's, for example, defence spending is an obvious one, so it's going to uh, bomb families in Afghanistan, some of your tax money. So. On those grounds, many people say, well, I'd rather not pay for that kind and, of thing. And do you think that's Amazon's uh, motive for... <laughs> no, but, uh, but also, I mean, they, they are paying tax. They're paying, their workers are paying tax from wherever uh, they are. So there's national insurance, income tax, etc., cetera, VAT. Um, but let's not forget as well that, um, I mean, taxes actually destroy wealth as well. They make, make societies poorer. It destroys, undermines the division of labour. Um, negates work incentives, um, reduces investment and therefore depletes the capital stock that makes everyone wealthier. <coughs> so there are strong economic reasons to be in favour of paying less tax and in the long run those companies paying less tax is actually good for the economy and actually fights poverty. Can I, Peter? Can I, I, uh, coming from a conservative perspective, I don't recognise anything which is being said by my colleague here by the Institute for Economic affairs libertarian point of view is 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 uh, interesting but from a conservative perspective paying taxes is is is, is, is a good thing to do um, of course uh, we 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 have an interest in the, uh, the the welfare of our fellow citizens and just from a nakedly capitalist point of view you want to have well trained employees from good schools and good education and transport and health and so forth. I don't, and I also think there's a very strong moral case for paying tax from a conservative point of view, which is why I strongly support this campaign which you have against tax dodgers, because I absolutely believe that it is, we, are, we belong uh, as conservatives, from a conservative perspective or, uh, to a community that we're all in it together as the Prime Minister says but doesn't do and the uh, and that is what we are as citizens um, and Amazon now let's just deal with the issue of Amazon I didn't know that but I do believe that uh, people who don't pay tax companies who don't, should be shamed uh, I didn't know this about Amazon and it now makes me much less likely to use them and uh, I do believe that as citizens and as political beings of the left or the right, that we have a duty and a, an opportunity now in the new political context since uh, 2008 to shame companies such as News International, such as Amazon, which don't pay their taxes, which don't fulfill their civic duties into, into, into doing that. Does that include living in Guernsey? I'm making no, a telegraph I, point here. I, 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 I have <laughs> never examined or looked into the uh, finances of those who own the telegraph. And I have to say that I have risen more or less what I've said here in the telegraph. I've attacked that was overly cheeky. Uh, and no, no, and I, well, I just want to say on behalf of the owners of the telegraph, whose, of, whose financial range I know nothing about, uh, is that uh, whenever I have called for tax, people to pay their taxes or the I have never had the faintest uh, <coughs> complaint from the editorial situation. Okay. Saviour. Let me just say, without dwelling on Richard's point, obviously I don't agree, but again, I think Richard's reducing everything to corruption represents, again, we see this every day, sort of a Western stereotypical um, view and lack of understanding of the realities. I'm, I'm neither you know, liberal or conservative but I, I live in a reality. 
and the reality is that when Zambia's annual budget share of the money they, they get from taxes increased compared to aid money, it increased to 60%, we immediately saw an increase in education spending and health spending. So for me, I don't know what kind of theory he's talking about, but what I see in reality is that definitely tax revenue has a role in terms of uplifting people's um, welfare. It's not as simple as government and the mining companies being corrupt. And, and it's mostly mining companies, international mining companies so it, in Zambia. That's one of them. I can cite another example in Zambia of another company outside the mining sector, which is estimated to have been touching, dodging taxes as well. So, I mean, the point is... The and is that because on their balance sheet they show their profits as existing in a somewhere else or they offset it in such a clever way that, that uh, it, it, they're not really deemed to be making any profits in Zambia. They always say they're making profits elsewhere or something like that. Is that how they do it? Well, they do it in different ways. In fact, if I was to argue the most corrupt societies are the Western societies that facilitate these kinds of things from happening through rules, for example, through tax havens. And, and, and I think we've seen in the last few years that a lot of um, Western countries have been victims themselves of these kind of, of things. So it's not entirely true to simplify and reduce everything to uh, corrupt um, uh, conspiracy theories between our governments and these companies. That, that seems right, Sabina, about, I mean, I, I, I would, I mean, Richard knows he's going to be uh, pushing against the grain here and so forth with, with talking about, you know, you shouldn't pay your taxes because the people you'd pay your taxes to are corrupt and they're going to start wars and so forth. But I mean, the, the truth of the matter is that there's, there's a huge amount of, of, of revenue and important work that the public sector are doing in these places and, and that needs to be properly financed. Yeah, and that's including for business. And, and what about a place where it's corrupt? What about a place where the government invests in the military? What about the place where it favors the vested interests who pay their taxes and then lobby on the other door for the taxes to be spent on them? In those cases where there is democratic space and it doesn't need to be formal democracy, then the place to invest energy is in these kind of citizen movements that start to raise issues, that start to take political space and voice and argue for taxes to be spent differently, raise awareness about the suffering of others, and object to the kind of investments that governments are done. And that, that kind of engagement then is necessary again to bring a more structural change to those societies. And that, that we see happening not only in formal democracies, um, but also in, in places that are not yet democracies. And, and that's, I think, the space that has to be taken, championed, and used uh, where uh, the public sector money otherwise might be squandered or might go to inefficiency or might go to corruption. And there, there, there are many, many different ways and angles to address corruption. Um, and so you can't be simplistic about it, but this is one of the biggest ones. I could give lots of examples. I, I think we should also not miss a point here. It's one thing to argue that if governments raise more money, it will go to corrupt activities or to be misused. It's another thing to say, should they raise more money? And how should they raise that money? I think if government, there is obviously an, a consensus that more governments need to raise money. They need to provide public services. They need to, to, to do all sorts of things that the private sector can do. And obviously, the most surest way, the most consistent way, the most independent way of raising money, especially for poor countries, is tax revenue. So it's a whole different debate, and we should not get mixed it up with how that money should be spent. P Peter spoke about shame and, uh, and the importance of... Um, as he saw it, sort of shaming people into, into sort of paying their whatever their fair share is. And I guess the shame issue is slightly linked to transparency of where, of where actually the money goes, because quite a lot of this, um, the, the way in which international companies particularly organise their tax affairs, is so complicated and so sort of off, off stage that we always get the suspicion that something you can easily get the suspicion that something dodgy is going on. I imagine even, Richard, that you would be keen on transparency of your financial affairs. Um, I think that's true of uh, governments, but not, uh, not private uh, financial affairs. I mean, that's what people forget uh, when they call for a crackdown on tax avoidance. What it actually means in reality is uh, more spies on people's private affairs, more a government agents knocking down doors and smashing businesses up and uh, seizing goods and confiscating assets. Um, I mean, this is the slippery slope towards a police state. And I think it's very naive as well to, to think that um, 
It's a very spending. niche view of transparency. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very naive as well that, um, to think that government spending is really doing that much good and, it's, and businesses are necessarily dependent can, can I on ask government you, spending can I, can I challenge you on points? I mean, one of the reasons I believe that it's very important that rich people and corporations pay tax is that we have a government which, rightly <coughs> in my views, is against benefit cheats, is against people and scrounge. Now, uh, you were saying it's okay for uh, pri rich private individuals to be non-transparent. Do you believe that people who are p accused of being benefit cheats should have a similar exemption from immunity from inspection by the agents of the state? I, I think, I think, I, I think pri private property, uh, I believe in private property rights, and I don't agree with the police having so many rights to start bashing people's doors down and going through their stuff. So, so it's, okay to fiddle your, it's okay to fiddle the dole uh, as, as it is to fiddle your, ex, uh, your taxes? Well, I, I personally, I, I want to move away from uh, state-sponsored welfare. Basically, what the government's doing, it's basically breaking people's legs and then giving them a pair of crutches. So it's actually um, denying them the means of subsistence by various, for example, housing. People aren't allowed to provide their own housing. The government has to do it through the planning laws, etc. Food, common agricultural policy, it should be cheap, but various government interventions shift with the price, same with energy, same with water. So basically, uh, I'd rather move to a voluntary system of welfare, and that's where morality comes into it as well, because if you're forced to give, that's not very moral. But if you actually voluntarily give to the poor, then that's very moral indeed. I mean, I'm going, to, I'm going to try and move this debate away from a small state, big state type of debate, because there's other things to say about it as well. So, um, and I think, that's, I think that you've, you've made that point. I just, I just feel that there is, um, there is a sort of, and, and, and I want, if you can do this without that reference to that sort of debate, um, to think about, you know, the idea that we contribute our fair share to society. And there's something very sort of st deeply moral about the idea that you ought to pay your fair share. Now, I know that you think that that should be done uh, it, privately rather than mediated through the public. But nonetheless, let's just stick on the, the paying your fair share bit. Um, what, but Peter, what is your fair share? I mean, you know, we have debates about how much tax we should pay in this country. How do we sort of get a grasp on what is the fair share for us to pay of our tax? I think if you look at um, post-war history, or, or history since we started to have a modern tax system, which maybe was 150 years ago, with the, um, you would um, say that you can see where it doesn't work. You can see that it, in the Victorian era where people paid practically no, well, there wasn't any income tax until the, 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 the start of the 19th century. There was terrible poverty, there was terrible infrastructure, and you can see that didn't work. Then you can look at the uh, immediate post-war period up to the 1970s, where um, you got economic degradation, and that was for a similar reason, where you really couldn't set up a business, you couldn't run a business, because the level of tax was so grotesquely high. So I think we can see that there is a, a median, um, and, uh, and I think that can be decided through the ballot box in the public sphere through debate. Um, I personally believe that the, that this is a personal opinion, that the Chancellor was wrong to bring down the 50p uh, rate of tax to 45p, and I think at this stage, at the, when, when you are uh, imposing tax across the, uh, cuts across the public sector. It's wrong to make the rich a bit better off. But that's, it's a very interesting argument. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I accept that it's an honorable case and, and, and an and a, and a economic legit, legitimate case. That lower taxes produces more economic uh, activity. And so it's an interesting debate. But I think it's within a fairly small um, parameters. But the key point of shaming people is really changing a culture. And one of the points that I think is very interesting here is that a lot of folks come to us because we measure poverty saying, we are private sector, we want to measure the triple bottom line. Um, but corporate the what did you say there? What? What did you say there? The the, they want to measure the triple bottom line. Triple They're, bottom they line. They want to measure their impact not only in profit but social and I see. environmental. But what's interesting is that corporate social responsibility right now does not include the expectation of tax pain. And to bring that in, in a sense, to the ethos and to change the culture, so that was part of the definition. And how much that was and how that was um, 
would vary in different circumstances, but I think that that's the kind of change that needs to happen and that hopefully movements like this will ignite. Savi, what sort of change do you want to happen? What would you practically like to happen to make the sorts of changes that you want? Well, I think it's quite clear from where I stand in terms of African countries' perspective, there is obviously the need to change the balance of power. Um, well, a bit of what um, Richard says, for example, it's a different case if you're talking about a state which is non-existent, where there's a breakdown of governance. That's not you know, the, the, the ideal situation, and indeed, that's not the case for most of Africa. I'm sorry to say, in the last 10 years, most of Africa has rapidly shifted, and you've seen a lot of positive things. So I'm not talking about that extreme case of always assuming that every state in, Afri in, in, in Africa is incapable of, of, of managing its affairs. Essentially, if you look at Zambia, the government of Zambia raises more tax revenue from individuals like me and others through pay, simply because, one, these people don't dodge tax, and even if they wanted to, they don't have the means, the power, and the mechanisms to do it. The mining companies and other big companies they don't pay a lot of tax in terms of tax rate, but even the little that they're supposed to pay, they go out of their way to avoid it simply because they can. So when you ask the question, what is a fair share of tax, we're not asking companies to pay much more than they should. We're just asking them to pay what they ought to pay. And part of the change that we want is one, for the system to be fair, the international system to be fair, for our government to be easily able to tell how much this company is supposed to pay, if companies say we've made so much profit, government should verify with relative ease without having to go through all these um, complicated processes. I think the two, the two processes should meet. For example, our own local citizens should be empowered to be able to feel that yes, they are all contributing um, just as, as, as much as the, the big companies are, are contributing. So I think my other point is around the issue of, if I may ask a question, who do you think should pay for the road that you use? Well, I, I tell you what, I'm, I, we'll do that a little bit later. I don't want to get into the sort of big state, small state stuff too much and so forth, because that takes us down a little, a, another sort of route, which I don't know, that's another interesting debate to have and so forth. Um, but I wanted, if I may, just to ask Sabina about whether, whether this is practically possible. Because what you have with very, very large um, multinational companies is, you know, very, very clever accountants. They always seem to be cleverer one stage ahead of those people who are in some ways regulating or trying to, to, to bring tax in. You know, you see that in the City of London, you see that in a whole range of places. And it almost feels that um, capitalism is such a powerful force to, to sometimes suck money out of some place and into others that it's very, very difficult for those who want to, you know, bring, bring in appropriate tax revenues to actually outwit that powerful force of self-interest. But you have to co-opt and not outwit. You have to collude and to find the friends inside that community who are also uneasy at not paying taxes, who also think that corporations should be governed differently. And they have the inside knowledge and they know the way this system works and by working together sort of across those boundaries but and it's not a bit of by demonizing of, them. Is that an admission of failure a bit, that the regulatory frameworks that we have just can't work? Yes. It is. Yeah. That's terrifying to me. It's not terrifying to Richard. Is it terrifying to Peter? <laughs> oh, very much so. No, I think it's one of the great problems uh, of our time, uh, uh, that we have uh, what people call globalization, the rise of these enormous multinational uh, companies which can hold governments to ransom and have no jurisdiction and it's allied to the uh, rise of the feral rich, the uh, people who, uh, who, who camp in, in countries uh, and uh, with no actual allegiance or sense of duty or responsibility. Uh, it's a major problem of our age and I do believe that there are mechanisms which governments have. Um, there are uh, cross-border organizations from the United Nations to the EU and so forth, WTO, which are capable of addressing these. Um, we haven't had much leadership on this yet, but I think that we are moving into a new era. I think we are moving into a time when the um, spectacular irresponsibility of the feral rich uh, can be uh, ad addressed and dealt with. C 
can I just ask, I'm going to open it up to the floor now, we're about to just do that, but before I do that, can I just ask you um, if you would, all of you, think about a word of advice from your different perspectives to these different organisations that are campaigning for tax justice. And if you were, as it were, you know, at the heart of this campaign for tax justice, what would your advice message, what is it, what is it that this, this campaign should practically do? Sabina. I think it's just really start the conversation at all levels and don't put people in boxes and demonize them too quickly, but to try to recruit people who have this sense of unease across the spectrum, the socioeconomic spectrum, including the fair isle rich, because they also have a need for meaning and a need to give back, a need to feel good about their, their contributions. Saviour. Well, building upon um, <clears throat> her point, I think yeah, it's very important that we bring on board different, even the non-traditional sort of um, actors. Uh, and the thing which is beginning to happen in most of the places where I'm beginning to talk to lawyers, for example, um, lawyer bodies, the bar associations, accountants, bankers, I think you, you need this sort of cross um, um, stakeholder kind of, of, of perspective because it is a very compl complex um, problem so it will require sort of um, very diverse views in, in tackling it. Richard? Yeah, I mean I think you raised a key question earlier which is who decides what a fair share is in terms of redistribution and personally I think people have different opinions on that and what I think is a fair share will be very different from other people's views and that's why I think voluntary agreements, voluntary giving, voluntary redistribution is a far better system than forcing people under the threat of violence to, to um, give away their wealth. Basically I, I think um, unfortunately this campaign is probably harmful and counterproductive and I think the focus should shift onto more important issues such as uh, trade barriers raised by the European Union and the United States. I mean, Saviour's I mean, Savior's question, which I, I will now, if I may, put about doing the roads. I mean, one of the, one of the problems with what you're describing is to many of us, it sounds like you're celebrating a failed state. I mean, actually, what a failed state looks like, where, you know, that public services are completely chaotic and everything's GRC private. Is a good it, it sounds like that that is your idea of heaven. It's not, but, I mean, think, looking back at what Peter mentioned, Britain in the 19th century, I mean, when public spending was maybe at its lowest point, maybe under 5% of GDP. And I mean, this was the most successful country on earth. It had the best infrastructure with the first railway network built by the private sector. Um, environmental conditions gradually improved by the end of the century. I mean, it's but a mistake would, to compare But tell that. that to the people who are dying of, of, dying of dysentery or of, of malnutrition in the streets just around here. Yeah, the, I mean, gov governments, government's really the main problem, and particularly in, in Africa. And, Really, a lot of the time it's tax dodging in the informal economy, the informal economy amongst the poor, they're, they're keeping the place afloat. But what the elites do is every few years, they come up and smash up the stalls, smash up the small businesses in the informal economy and ruin it and stop the long-term investment. So I say, let the informal economy grow. That's, African entrepreneurs are brilliant, they can get the economy going, but these corrupt elites, they want all the, the rents for themselves and they'll smash it up and ruin it. And so I think we need to go onto a different track, to be honest. Peter, if you had a, a, a word of advice or, yeah. to, to, to this, or, to this um, coalition. I think governments can change the message they send out to people who's, who, who's take, who are tax dodgers. I mean, I was amazed that people, I mean, I couldn't believe it. With the man, there's a man called Green who, who owns uh, stores, Philip Green. He was given a knighthood even though he sort of took a billion pounds offshore so he couldn't have to pay tax. The last, the new Labour gave him a night. Pop stars who kind of, they all have top class accountants in the city who park their, their money in, damage their commercial interests. Why should we go to, if you, why should we damage people commercially in their pockets? Governments can say, use the power of government and the public pulpit to do huge damage to people who refuse to pay their taxes. Murdoch was allowed, among many other things, to get away with not paying any tax at all in this country, but because governments were so pathetically scared of him. And I do think that governments can use their, um, use, the, use, use, the, use that ability to shame people into behaving, behaving simply in a proper civic way.